Well, hello and a big warm welcome to Matrix Submerged. What on earth does that mean? Well, it means exactly what it says on the tin. This is Matrix and we are going below the surface underwater to find out all sorts of things about how your rigs behave, about how fish behave, about how feed behaves. We're gonna bust some myths and we're gonna give you loads and loads of tips about how to catch more fish. Make no mistake, this series will be a winner. Now, I'm out today at Green Hills in Warwickshire. It's a natural venue, it's crystal clear water, and we're gonna be looking at some fantastic things such as indication, presentation, and accuracy. So joining me on the box today is top feeder angler and England international, Jamie Harrison. Now, Jamie, great opportunity, natural venue. What do you want to know? We want some answers. You know, I'm a feeder angler. I sit there a lot of the time just wondering how my feeder's landing, how my rig's performing under there, and what kind of um, bite detection we're getting when we're sat waiting for bites, you know, and how far fish can move with our bait, all those sorts of questions. Fantastic, well I've had the opportunity of doing this before now and I think I know some of the answers, but okay. it'll be great on a venue like this to see the difference. Accuracy is also very, very important, isn't it? Yes. So we'll look at that too. So without further ado, I'll get the rig on, you can get your kit ready and let's get on with the show. Can't wait. Jamie set up a simple free running rig similar to that he uses for a large amount of his own fishing. He'd also attached a 50cm hook length, the length required when fishing international matches. After a few exploratory casts and a little help from me, we found the ideal clear spot at around 30 metres which would be our target area for the day. The first thing Jamie wanted to know was how his rig behaved underwater, where his bait landed in relation to his feeder and just how much I could move his bait before we spotted a bite. Right, this is the first cast with a 50 centimetre hook length. I've just got three maggots on for visibility, but it's 50 centimetre hook length on a free running rig, and this is on mono. The plan was to test both presentation and bite detection, first with a 50 centimetre hook length, followed by a 30 centimetre hook length. Jamie's first cast hit the water, and it was finally time to get some results. Spotting the feeder wasn't easy, but I followed Jamie's line and found it sitting just past the clear spot in some soft weed. Although his feeder was in the weed, his hook bait could be seen on the clean bottom. Interestingly, the first thing I noticed was just how close the maggots were sitting to the feeder. Remember, this first cast was with a 50cm hook length, yet on closer inspection and with the help of the trusty tape measure, the hook bait was just 15cm from the feeder, resulting in 35cm of slack line between the hook bait and the feeder. As mentioned, we wanted to take a look at bite detection, and Jamie was sat watching his tip as he would in a fishing situation. The brief was for him to strike as soon as he saw what he would consider to be a bite. To help Jamie and the camera pick up the bites in the very windy conditions, we positioned a target board behind the tip. I picked up the hook bait, which you know was sat just inches from the feeder. It was apparent that I could move the hook bait anywhere I wanted and no bite was detected. It was only when I moved away from the feeder and tightened up the line that Jamie spotted the bite and struck. The amount I could move the hook bait before a bite was detected was clearly an issue, but I must say I was impressed with how easily and quickly Jamie spotted the bite as soon as I tightened up to that feeder. Oh, it's gone bad cast. We've got this wind blowing into us today and that cast felt a little bit short. It felt short, whether it was or not, I don't know, but it didn't quite hit the clip as hard as the first cast, but it'll be interesting to see where it actually landed, actually on the lake bed. Jamie was correct, the cast was out slightly, but only by about two foot. At this point, however, Jamie hadn't seen any of the footage, so I had no idea of what lay below the surface. As you can see, there's weed growing up off the bottom, and this is where Jamie's feeder had landed. Although his feeder landed on the bottom, his hook bait can clearly be seen attached to the weed. If this was a fishing situation, the chances of getting a bite would be pretty slim, but how long would you sit there thinking you were waiting for a fish? As I'm a nice guy, I headed back to the surface and told Jamie to have another cast. A 
lot of went in a little bit better that time. Like I said, that wind's making it a bit awkward, but it'll be interesting to see how that one landed. As the feeder went in, it was interesting to see that quite a few particles came off it as it dropped through the water, and this resulted in a column of bait from the surface right down to the bottom. Once again, the feeder landed near the weed, but this time the hook was free from any obstruction. The hook bait had fallen further away from the feeder this time, around 25 centimetres, which would still give 25 centimetres a slack line before a bite would be detected. You can see on the clip just how far a fish could move without creating a bite. Once again though, as soon as I tightened the line, Jamie saw the bite and hit it in an instant. So all we're doing now is we've just done the first little test with a 50 centimetre hook length. So what I'm going to do now is shorten this down now to 30 centimetres just to see how much now Rob's going to be able to move the bait before we actually see an indication on the tip. What had become apparent to me already was that fishing a long hook length doesn't result in your hook bait being that same distance from your feeder but it would be interesting to see the results with a slightly shorter hook length. Right I've just changed that hook length now so again we're on a free running rig with mono but we've shortened that hook length down to 30 centimetres now just to see what difference it makes to bite registration. Yeah, much better that. That one went in much better. We just come back five turns. We know there's a little patch of weed down there, which Rob's obviously identified. So I've just taken five, well, it's not five full turns, it's five wraps of the spool. So it's a tiny little bit shorter, but hopefully it's clear of weed now. Interestingly enough, when Rob said that feed has actually been sat in weed, when I've reeled in, I've had no trace whatsoever of that. Even when I picked up, there was nothing there. I, I wouldn't have been any wiser. Makes you wonder how many times you sat waiting for a bite and, and your rig sat in some sort of obstacle like that without us even knowing it. As I approached the target area, I could clearly see the feeder sat just on the edge of the clear spot. You can also see the maggots that are sat just inches from the feeder, meaning a 30 centimeter hook length resulted in a very similar presentation to the 50 centimeter hook length. The tape measure shows that the hook bait was just six centimetres from the feeder and I could move the bait freely without a bite registering on the tip. Once again though, as soon as I moved it the full 30 centimetres to tighten the line, Jamie hit the bite instantly. As had been the case on all other casts, a very neat pile of bait was left on the bottom. Right, well we've just done that round of tests now. Um, so we've just switched the rig now, I've actually switched to a, a fixed rig now which is more like a, a you know, it's a Paternoster type rig. So we're gonna do the same sort of test again, same number of casts, again with a 30 centimeter hook length and a 50 centimeter hook length. Rob's heading back out there now. So we're just gonna have a see, just have a look how this bite registration is gonna to compare to the free running rig. For this next set of tests, we switched baits from maggot to worm. We were interested to see if a heavier bait would keep the hook bait further away from the feeder. As the feeder settled I approached the area and I could see again that the hook bait was around 15 centimetres from the feeder. Picking up the worm once again I had to move the bait the full length of the hook length before Jamie spotted the bite. repeated the test again with a 50 centimeter hook length and once again the worm fell close to the feeder. As I've done similar tests with carp anglers in the past I was expecting this result but it was interesting to see that the only difference between a 30 and a 50 centimeter hook length was how far you had to move the bait before a bite would be detected. Right so now we've just tried those what we're going to do now is just try the same rig again but with a thicker hook length, a thicker diameter, 019. So I'm just going to have a look now to see how that settles on the bottom. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a cast out there. It's an 019 hook length. It's 50 centimetres long, but a lot of people think that because it's thicker, it's going to land straighter when it hits the when it goes on the bottom of the lake bed. So we're going to cast this out and find out. From my position, I could see the feeder hit the surface, and I managed to capture the fall of the feeder perfectly. You can see a trail of bait being deposited, and you'll also notice the feeder is falling in an arc rather than straight down. This should encourage the hook length to stay away from the feeder, but as we'd already discovered, this wasn't actually the case, although I don't think even I was ready for what would happen next. The worm hook bait had actually fallen straight down and was sat inside the feeder. Have you ever retrieved a feeder and wondered how your line had gone in one side and come out the other? Well, now you know. This immediately proved the theory wrong that a thicker hook length would kick the hook bait further away from the feeder. To test the bite detection, I had to dig the worm out of the feeder. Bite detection when the line was tight was once again unbelievable. As soon as I tightened against the feeder, Jamie spotted the bite and hit it so quick, in fact, that he hooked me in the glove. Oh, a lovely bite, and it's just locked up. <laughs> you hooked him. I might have. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have. I won't pull too hard. <laughs> After a quick break to unhook myself, it was back on with the test. Well, we've just gone through now trying a thicker diameter hook length and uh, it'll be interesting to see the footage from that. What we're going to try now is a longer hook length. I'm going to step up to 100 centimetres, which is usually about the longest that we tend to use on most occasions. And we're going to see how that works again on the same rig and see how it settles. Right, well, that was that test. I've now gone on to a, a one metre hook length now. So let's see how that performs and how it lands out there on the bottom. Obviously with longer hook lengths, I tend to use longer hook lengths when you're catching fish up in the water for that slower fall, it gives the bait longer to fall. As regards landing on the bottom, I think a lot of people just believe that it lands further past the feeder than a shorter hook length would. I guess we're going to find out. We had several casts with a one metre hook length with pretty consistent results. You can see from this cast just how close the bait landed to the feeder and it seemed that 15 to 25 centimetres was the norm regardless of the length of the hook length. The one metre hook length did enable me to move the hook bait an even greater distance before the bite was detected and the fish would be nearly out of your swim before you would see the bite. It was time to head back to the bank and have a chat with Jamie about my findings. Well, that was properly interesting, yeah. wasn't it? And I must say that I was a little bit surprised about how far the bait didn't travel because there seems to be this common myth that it's going to go away. What, what do you think there? Yeah, I've heard it for many years that, you know, you put a longer tail on, for example, you think it's going to land a long way from your feeder. That's kind of opened our eyes a little bit, you know, it's really been surprising. Didn't really make a difference either between the heavy bait and the light bait because I thought the maggots might have an effect and the worm would come down differently, but it was close all round, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, you'll be measuring it to give us some exact figures and things, but yeah, it's been surprising how close that hook bait was landing to a feeder. Well, if you think about closeness, one of them was actually in the pot, <laughs> yeah. and the furthest away was 11 inches on that. Now, we're fishing in anything between six and eight foot of water, because it is a bit of a slope down there, so six to eight foot of water, and also, uh, it's what, 32 yards, was it? Yep, yep. Yeah, so well, 32 bang on 31 there. metres. 31 metres, yep. so yeah, 32, 33 yep. yards, 31 metres. So you get the sort of gist of what we're doing. I'd be interested to see what happens if we were to go a little bit further out and also whether or not there's any difference with deeper water because I suspect that if there is a bit of deeper water and also with a harder punch as well, you might pull that bait away. Yes. And, you know, the, the, these are just thoughts of mine as opposed to definite findings, but the feeder was relatively light in this wind particularly coming into your face but we yeah. had to do that because that was the rig that we were testing today i think that if you were punching it a bit harder and it was say uh, you know a different type of feeder i think you might get a little bit of separation but again that's something to test isn't it <laughs> certainly yeah i mean we have different designs of feeders for a reason and cast into a headwind like we've you know what we're faced with today obviously gives you a different presentation and that's why 
quite often sometimes we change the style of a feeder and yeah, it yeah. results in a fish. We don't always know why. Yeah. I think we might be getting one or two answers. So let's have a look at the difference now with the longer hook link. Now immediately we think that will make a big difference but guess what? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't it, make that much difference did it? No surprisingly. I mean I, I hear this discussion all the time. I had it again last week. I was fortunate enough to be fishing elsewhere in Europe last week. And it, even in other countries, they still talk about it. Fishing a longer hook length, a lot of people expect that your hook bait is going to be landing a lot further away from your feeder than it would do with a shorter hook length. And today has kind of opened our eyes to that, you know. Didn't really make that much difference at all, did it? And no. then we move on to the other big point, which is the thickness of the line diameter, because yeah. there is another general myth that people have that if you use a thicker line then that's going to make a big difference. What were your thoughts and findings on that? The interesting thing with that is I hear people on commercials because they're fishing for bigger fish they're fishing with thicker hook length lines and a lot of them are doing it because they think it's giving them a better chance of hooking bigger fish but obviously the issue of presentation is an issue. A lot of people say the think thicker diameters are kicking out because it's stiffer it's kicking the bait further away from the feeder. I've got to admit I was a big believer in that that it did have an effect and today, again, has just kind of proved and otherwise. Now, we have <laughs> cast 24 times, I think, in certain tests. We can't show you them all because, quite frankly, it's just the same thing repeated time and time again. But we do that so we can get a good mark of exactly what it is. And this is where basic physics come into play. So there's two things that you need to think about. One is levers, the other is gravity. Gravity is where it pulls down. Levers is where it pushes out. So if you want your hook bait to move away from your lead, what you've got to do is you've got to use something here which is strong enough to beat the force of gravity pulling down. So the heavier the hook bait, the stiffer the hook and material. And we've seen it in carp fishing for a long, long time where we critically balance baits and push them away. And you use very, very light supple lines with sometimes quite heavy baits, i.e. three maggots is quite heavy, but then when you put a worm on it, that is really, really heavy. Yeah. So, you know, this is the difference. If you want to kick it out, you've got to have something that's stiff and that will hinge out. Mm. Whether or not it will make a difference to bite rate, who knows? Does it need to be close to it or should it be away? That's something that maybe we'll look at in the future. Yes. One of the things that I want to touch on straight away is how important accuracy is. And you know, you've seen from down there, we go into the water, we go out and immediately there's different bits everywhere. You've got a nice big flat bit, you've got a bit with rolling small weed, you've got big tall weeds, you've got effectively woodwork as well. And you know, match anglers, I think they might fish in a line a lot of the time and they might think, I far you fish in 50 yards, I might fish 50 yards as well. We're in completely different areas. You can yeah. be in a different area if you're that far apart, let alone 50 yards <laughs> apart. So what, what were your thoughts on that as well, looking at the presentation differences? The interesting thing with that is, is as a feeder angler, we, we quite often cast a bomb out and have a quick feel around. I think we've got a bit of a mental picture of what it's like out there. Obviously today we're in a fortunate position to get visual evidence of what it's like out there. And it's been amazing to see that even six inches to either side, the contours and, and the um, features on the bottom were completely different. And sometimes, in fact, in most cases, I was picking up and reeling in and I had no idea how bad the presentation was out there. How there, was, there was one time where it was actually hung up in the weed, wasn't it? And, you know, I think what you've always got to do, guys, is if you're fishing a natural venue, particularly if it's clear water, just take it that there will be weed, whether it's that much or whether it's that much, there will be weed around. But do not fear, because today has resulted in a product idea that at some stage... Yeah. will be out and no doubt that will solve the problem for you as well and that's one of the great things isn't it that you know we test our products quite uh, uh you know quite in depth but it's when you come out and do this that you can see exactly how they work how they don't work when they should do and how they do work when in different ways yeah and also we come up with new ideas and already a couple of new ideas perfect so that's it for the moment here. I think uh, the key is that we will be back on the bank at some stage in the very near future. If you have got anything that you would like to know, then hit us up on the page. Alternatively, don't forget that you must subscribe to Club Matrix. You'll get all of the news and all the information really, really quickly. And also you can tell us what you want to see and we will sort it out for you.